I'm John, one of the leaders here, uh, and it's a very warm welcome to all you, particularly those of Emma's friends and family who come to witness something very special uh, in a moment or two's time. Let's just hope the, uh, the sermon before it doesn't put a dampener on anything that comes after it, because it's really very special. Valentine's Day has gone for another year, which is fantastic. For me, it's a, a day of shame for us non-romantics. It's a day of sadness for many people and a day of utmost tackiness. That's my view anyway. I hate it as much as I hate, well, I was going to say Harry Potter, but after last week's sermon from Martin, I better not say any more. So ignore that, remove that from your uh, hearing. Um, And why do I hate it? Not Harry Potter, but why do I hate uh, Valentine's Day so much? Well, I want you to look at what I received on Monday uh, from Inkredible, an ink cartridge supplier. (laughs) They can justify it by putting in the word compatible. That's the only link with Valentine's Day that I can possibly uh, think of, compatible. Well, our neighbours came to lunch uh, last Sunday and their grandchildren live in Los Angeles. Um, And they had to, this is the grandchildren, had to write 35 Valentine's cards for all the people that were in their classes with love from X, um, all of their classmates, uh, so no one felt left out in any way. All of them received love from everyone. How dreadful to know that the only reason you received a card was because your teachers told your other fellow pupils to send them. (laughs) I thought I got away with it on the day on Monday, but uh, Catherine, whom I love very, very much, yet has never received anything from me on this particular day in the whole of our nearly 50 years of married life, um, happened to come, happened to come and share with me and to remind me what day it was. And she shared from uh, Lectio 365, the reflections that many people use uh, in their daily start. Um, But I was quite pleased in one sense because Pete Gregg, um, uh, who who sort of helps uh, head it up, is, is on my side. This is what his prayer for the day or part of it was. It says, King of love, on this day named after one of your unmarried saints, embrace the unlovely, and unloving parts of the world and of myself today. Forgive me for the cheap, gaudy, hysterical, isolating thing that I have sometimes, somehow, tried to make of love and of you. Today is all about real love. It's all about true love. It's all about sincere love. It's all about God's love for us, for us. So we're continuing the letter, the first letter of John. And it was said of John by a a historian called Jerome that when the aged apostle John became so weak he could no longer preach, uh, he used to be carried into the congregation at Ephesus, which had become his base, and then he would content himself uh, with a few words of exhortation. Little children, he would always say, love one another. Well, when his hearers grew really tired of him saying this week in, week out, they asked him why he frequently repeated it. And he responded, because it is the Lord's command, and if this is all you do, it is enough. The message of love has actually been snatched away from our hands, brothers and sisters, by those who say that everything is permissible if they love each other. They say that everyone deserves love in their lives and that when we speak something slightly different to that, a different message, then we are the ones that are bigoted and unloving. Well, everyone does need, not deserve, need love in their lives. And our message is that God's love is deeper, greater, higher, stronger, wider than anything else that you get from anywhere else. The Apostle John, of course, writes in a very different style. You might have picked it up over the few weeks we've been doing it. Uh, um, Revelation is very different, very, very different. The Gospel is different to the other three accounts of Jesus' life. And the letters here 
are also very different. They, they're described as a sort of more Jewish uh, feel to them. Um, it's, it's more that they are sort of in spirals. It's, it's as if it's a story that is being told. It doesn't follow straight lines and it is repetitive. It's as if somebody has described it like eating raspberry ripple ice cream stuff that flows through it and you come across the flavor of it uh, repeatedly uh, during the time that you're enjoying it. Now, Western Christianity, which is what we're part of, has been influenced a huge amount by Rome. And, and who influenced Rome? Well, the Apostle Paul uh, influenced Rome in particular. And, and you can tell from his letters that Paul writes in a very different style. It's often in straight lines. It's often in, in, in a logical uh, framework. It's helping you to understand some deep uh, truths of Scripture. And sometimes we don't quite understand the deep truths of Scripture. So it goes into more depth at a time and does that. It's very precise. It's it's not always that easy to listen to or to read, and yet at the same time, it is logical and straightforward. It's almost in many ways why we have sermons today. It's a sort of lecture style. Um, it, it's something, of course, that uh, had to be because many of the people couldn't read uh, Greek or Latin in previous generations. We have the scriptures which we should celebrate and rejoice. But Celtic Christianity is something very, very different. That's been influenced a lot by John and the way that he is. It's centered around story. It's, it's, it's more about feelings and emotions. It's more, less structure, more creativity. And that's what we get here in the letter of John. Hence today, why I actually want to chat to you. I don't want to lecture at you. I want to involve you. I want to bring you in rather than say what it is from the front. I don't want you to uh, be listening and admire the logic in anything I might say. I want to draw you in to listen to what the conversation from John is all about. So John is repeating the same message. It's the same message you've heard perhaps last week, the week before, the week before that, and all the times that we've been looking at one John. And it's as if John is saying... I know I've said it before. I know you've heard it before. But you don't seem to be living as if you have heard it before. And that's the message that we're getting today. So let's read the passage uh, together. It's going to come up. And I'm uh, specifically uh, speaking from the New International Version. And there is a reason why that is. So it's 1 John uh, chapter 2, uh, starting at verse 28. And then we go into uh, chapter 3. It'll come up on the screens. And now, dear children, continue in him, so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that, you might, that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, don't let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. 
Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. Quite hard hitting, isn't it? Remember, these are John's words, not mine. They're John's words. Let's just listen to them and allow God to touch our hearts. As Joan prayed earlier, let's our hearts be open to what God will reveal to them. So the message are simple, and we have had them before. And Martin recapped on what had been done the previous weeks. And I'm not going to recap, but you'll see that the same message is starting to flow through all of the preachers. The message number one is that in verse, uh, chapter, chapter 3 and verse 1, it says this, Through God's love we have become children of God. Eight times John says, Dear children, little children, in the whole of his letter. Verse 2 says, children of God. Verse 10 says, children of God, child of God. In his gospel that he wrote, in in chapter 1, he says this, to all who believe, he gave the right or power to become children of God. And we just read it sometimes and we, we take it for granted. But today I want you to really take it into your very heart. And we become so by being born again. In verse 9, it says, born of God. Again, in his gospel, chapter 3 of his gospel, it says, being born again, starting again in a new spiritual family. Not of Adam, but of Christ. The slate has been wiped clean. Secondly, as children of God, we're grateful for Christ's first coming. But actually, we are joyfully expectant of his second coming. Verse 2, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, as part of the elders' visits to uh, all of the uh, small groups, um, I, I uh, had to go with Nino. It was, you know, lots, and unfortunately, we got the short straw to go to the Uden small group. I know, I know, it's pretty grim. Uh, but as part of the opening worship, so I, I do know who they are, so don't worry. Um, as part of the opening worship, we had a song from Stonely. And anyone below the age of 25 hasn't got a clue what Stonely actually is. I I think it was something that occurred in the sort of 18th century or something of that nature. It was a long time ago. Uh, But whenever you talk to somebody who has been uh, to Stonely, they always talk about it in sort of hushed tones, a sense of awe, a sense of, oh, you should have been there. Oh, oh, it was marvelous. Oh, oh. And they... That's all they say sometimes is, oh, it's it's as if they've they've got something very special to say, but give you absolutely no detail of what's going on. Uh, This week, we uh, had uh, Joe and Lauren Chick for uh, a meal, and I said to Joe about Stonely, and he he repeated the same message. Now, he was five when he went to Stonely, and he said, oh, 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 Stonely, Oh, oh, five alive. That was it. I didn't have any more information. Five alive. That sounds like some radio program or something of that nature. But anyway, one of these songs that was played at Stonely, and there were many wondrous worship songs that came out of it. It stopped, by the way, in 2001 um, and was wonderfully, wonderfully successful. Stopped at its height, which is a wonderful thing to do in many ways. But anyway, one of the songs that came out uh, was This Is The Day, and we sang that at the Uden small group. It's about the second coming, of course, and actually has the line plucked that I've just read earlier on. But we know that when he Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And unfortunately, it goes on to say, oh yeah, some of you. It's, it's an interesting song, oh yeah, okay. Now, quite frankly, the Udens group didn't quite reach the passion that we heard on the CD as we played, uh, but actually they did very well, and it was great to be reminded of Christ coming again and have that joyful expectancy of him coming. Ollie's song, Holy is the Name of the Lord, is similar, describing when we shall see Christ in all his fullness for the first time. It'll be had at my funeral at some stage, if it's still going uh, at that, that stage as well. And it says this, and there is he, more beautiful 
than anything I've seen. Uh, thirdly, the third message we've got in verse uh, 28 of the previous chapter, chapter 2, it says that there should be no embarrassment at his coming. Unrighteous con uh, conduct is unthinkable in the Christian who has grasped the purpose of those two appearances that I've just talked about of Christ. Both are strong incentives to holiness. Those who have given their lives to Christ look back to the first coming with gratitude, with thanks in their hearts. Christians who then fix their eyes on the confident hope of the second coming will purify themselves, it says in verse 3. Think of meeting the queen, for instance, or uh, if you are like Ninoy, swearing allegiance to the queen, looking very smart, you'll see him on Facebook indeed, on Thursday uh, when he became a British citizen. All right, for the first time. Where are you, Ninoy? Yeah, yeah, we go. <laughs> Terrific. He did say to me, the only person who's a foreign in our house now is Kafwi. So, you know, that's, uh, your time will come. Okay, she's welcome in the house still. It's amazing, so. Um, but yeah, think, think of that. He looked really, really smart indeed. Um, um, and and that's, that's what we do, isn't it? When we meet people who are really important and we know about it. I can think of something considerably less significant. Um, when I work with Boots, and I, there's a Boots pharmacist that's just arrived for the first time today, and I'll have a chat with him afterwards, but it's great. You know, I oversaw uh, quite a few stores, and 50% uh, of the time when I visited those stores, I didn't tell them I was coming, okay? I, I wanted to see what reality was. But 50% of the time, I told them I was coming. Um, and of course, on those occasions, they needed to be ready, didn't they? Um, they needed to do all that they knew that they should have been doing all of the time. Um, and instead of being embarrassed when I arrived, they actually should be looking forward with joy for me to step through those doors of the store. I think it did happen on a few occasions. I've, I've written them down over uh, my 30 odd years, but I think there were one or two occasions when I did bring some joy uh, in that case and they looked forward to it with joy. Last week, Kim Brown brought a word from God, and uh, some of you will remember that, uh, about, uh, about the Lord uh, and us as his bride, making ourselves ready. Um, now, I did say to her afterwards, I thought she'd got the timing of her bringing that wrong, and if she could bring it again this week, it would fit into the sermon a bit more. Um, but uh, she hasn't done that yet, um, uh, but it is true. It is about the bride, that's us of Christ, making ourselves ready. But listen to this. In Christ's coming again, he is the one who makes us perfect. We can be ready, but he is the one that transforms us to be like he is, which is amazing. The fourth simple message that we get from that, and verse 10 puts this very, very strongly. Uh, it says the ongoing, continuous, deliberate desire to sin, note the words that I've used, because don't forget we all sin at some stage, but the ongoing, continuous, deliberate desire to sin is a sign that you are a child of the devil still, and not a child of God. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, it says. Nor is anyone who does not love his brother and sister. Really key phrases that you've heard already in this series. Not doing what is right is about breaking God's law, not man's current law. It's pretty obvious, aren't there, that we live in the UK. There are now many things that are accepted as legal, which actually are still against God's desire for mankind and for his children. These verses, though, are written to Christians. They're not written in some sort of moralistic preach at the world that's around. They're written to Christians. So we shouldn't go around moralizing all the time. We should look to ourselves. We should look at the body of Christ here, and we should assess ourselves as to whether by our lives we are demonstrating that we are children of God. When our James uh, was uh, considerably younger and corresponding with a girl from Australia in the early days of, of, of internet, 
uh, she was about to do something pretty significant, uh, uh, not, not a great action. And he wrote to her and says this, our family doesn't do that. It came quite as a surprise because he was quite rebellious at that stage. Um, but he still took on board, our family doesn't do that. And when Joshua spoke to the children of Israel when they crossed uh, uh, from, uh, um, from, the, uh, uh, from Egypt and they'd gone all through the deserts and were just about to go into the promised land, he said this, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And my challenge to you now is, whose family do you belong to? Whose family do you belong to? In a moment, we're going to uh, baptize Emma. She is doing it out of obedience to God, repent and be baptized. It's a demonstration of what has happened to her through Jesus. She will go down into the water uh, as a sign that she has died to sin and then has been washed clean and comes out of the water in newness of life with the spirit uh, inside her and uh, focused on living her new life in Christ. Our prayers thereafter uh, will be a sign uh, that we are praying that the Holy Spirit will come and move and work in her life. We want to see that be an overflowing, and it, you've got plenty of time, because I've still got another hour of this. No, it's okay. It's not, it's not that bad. That's fine. Um, but it, we'll be praying that she will use her will and God's strength to live the way that God wants her to do. Baptism is not a tick box exercise. No initiation ceremony into some secret society. It's a public declaration that says, I belong to the family of God, and now I am going to live as such. But I want to talk now about God's love. What I've described already can be seen as a bit legalistic, I think, in many ways. Someone said to us the other day that when you become a Christian, it's all about grace. But as soon as you do so, it's about don't do this, but do that. It seems about the law and becomes something which says, oh, don't sleep with your boyfriend or girlfriend before you're married. It says, start giving your money to God. It says, stop having any sort of fun, or so it might seem. Come to the prayer meeting instead, which is a complete reversal, of course, of what we really want to be talking about. Or as Martin put it last week very well, it seems to be about behavior management, and we don't want that. If it seems like that, and I'm sorry, that's not what the heart of God is all about. John says this to you, to the people in, that received that letter, that God loves you. Verse 1, it says this, and that's why I use the NIV. See what great love the Father has lavished upon us. See what great love the Father has lavished upon us. Now, this is love belonging to another world. You've not seen anything like this before. The, the feeling in the original Greek was, wow, this is extraordinary. This is amazing. Look in wonder. You won't see anything before like this. It's love so strong that it takes your breath away. Now, when Jesus gave the, the first sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, it's described as, the people said afterwards they, they were amazed because they'd not heard anyone speak like that before. He spoke with authority, not like the teachers that they had. This was altogether something else, something different. It is of another world. Now, in the widely read book um, of Gentle and Lowly, Dane Ortberg says this, that there is no love so great and so wonderful as that which is in the heart of of Christ. Secondly, this love is a love of another depth. We talk about lavish, used in the version that I read. Love that the Father has lavished on us. We know about lavish lifestyles. We know about lavish cars. We know about all sorts of things. But here, we have lavish love. It comes from the sort of French and uh, uh, from the Latin, uh, to wash. And it's as if it's talking about the sense of being completely immersed in a beautiful, 
warm, deep bath of perfume-filled, bubble-filled extravagance. Unfortunately, Emma, when she's in there, the paddling pool that we've got, there isn't quite conjuring that same sort of image. But for you, take that image of what being lavished is all about. Paul uses the same word, lavish, when he's talking in Ephesians about grace, that we've been lavished with God's grace. And of course, grace is the outworking of love. It's the natural outflow from love is grace to one and all. The song uh, we sing quite a lot in church at times is how deep the Father's love expresses it so well. How deep the Father's love for us, vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make this wretch his treasure. Again, John's Gospel, uh, chapter 13, says this, before he went to the cross, having loved his own, own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love by the giving of his life. Now, John Newton, a, a former ship's captain in the slave industry, he understood it when he wrote Amazing Grace that saved a wretch like me. Charles Wesley, again, another fantastic songwriter, he got it as well. He understood it completely when he wrote, And Can It Be? Emptied himself of all but love and bled for Adam's helpless race. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? But do you get it? Do you really get it? Do I really understand it? The vastness of it all. Do you know that you are God's beloved? You are Christ's beloved. In the Song of Songs in the Old Testament, um, it, we capture a glimpse of God's love. Chapter 2 says this, The lover to the beloved, show me your face. Let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. Here we have what some describe as an, an erotic and beautiful poem of love, not a tacky heart-shaped balloon that'll gradually go down after a short period of time, but it's also a description of Christ's love, the lover for his church, the beloved and bride-to-be. Jesus calls you agapetos, from the word agape, the beloved, in Christ and it means that you've been loved with the same love that God has for Jesus isn't that extraordinary now when I first became a Christian uh, I knew that I was Christ's beloved many a speaker would lean over the pulpit not that we actually had pulpits uh, in those days and cry beloved beloved do you know you're Christ's beloved now Christ had changed my life absolutely dramatically he had demonstrated his love for me in dying for my place. I knew that. He had placed me as well in a loving, beautiful expression of himself in the church. And we don't always say that, do we? A loving, beautiful expression of himself in the church. I knew I'd been forgiven much, and therefore I always loved God very much in those early days. Now remember the story that we had in uh, Luke uh, chapter 7, 47, where the woman comes and anoints Christ's feet with this really expensive perfume. And it says of her uh, that her many sins were forgiven and therefore she loved much. She loved Christ much and demonstrated that by, by worshipping him with that perfume on his feet. There are many people who say that they, they would like to have a testimony like that. We hear testimonies today as we approach uh, baptism. Uh, and there are many that might say that I'd love a testimony like my life was full of drugs and uh, sex and debauchery. My life, in fact, was full of every sin of every kind. And then at the age of 12, I gave my life to Christ. <laughs> what I want to say to you this is everyone has a testimony that is fantastic. Everyone is in a position where they were nowhere uh, with Christ, and now they are in Christ's family. Everyone has a testimony that they are lavished uh, in love, and they come to realize that without Christ, they are nothing, 
and that they will spend eternity without Christ, but with him, they're going to spend an eternity with Christ. So what's the response in our heart? Well, it's to love back. I want to follow forever. I want to live my life as Christ wants me to live. I want to reflect that I am a child of God. The love of God is not law-ish. It's lavish. It's not following a set of rules. It's following the heart of God. So often we want to live for the heart of God, to please him, to earn his favor. But actually, we need to learn to live from the heart of God. It's not trying to please him, as in my boots analogy earlier on. It's about us living from a union with Christ, with Christ's heart in us. Dane Ortberg puts it wonderfully. The battle for the Christian life is to bring your heart into alignment with Christ. That is, getting up each morning and replacing your natural orphan mindset with a mindset of full and free adoption into the family of God. Through the work of Christ, your older brother, who loved you and gave himself for you. I end with this. Two weeks ago, Alexei brought these verses uh, to the staff team. They're from Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 12. And they're part of Moses' blessing before he died. And he blessed all of the other tribes. And the one uh, that uh, she read from was to Benjamin, who was described as the most loved of Jacob's or Israel's sons, the youngest one. And it says this, Let the beloved of the Lord rest secure in him, for he shields him all day long. And the one the Lord loves rests between his shoulders. Beloved children of God, you have nothing to prove. You are loved, redeemed, forgiven, given everything for life and godliness. And it is immutable. That means it's unchanging and can never be changed. You sit right now between Christ's shoulders, by his heart, with his strong arms around you. In a moment, we're going to worship. We're going to ask the parents to go and uh, collect the youngsters. The youth will be returning in a moment. But right now, just take one more moment, please, to stop and to listen. Listen to Jesus cry into your heart beloved. Let him speak over you the word beloved and listen to him and hear him say, come to me and know that you are his child with his loving arms around you. Let's just take some quiet and then I'm going to ask uh, uh, Sam to come up with the band and then we can start to worship as the youngsters come in. But just take this moment for yourselves and God. Beloved, child of God, you are mine. I love you. You're part of my family. I desire to see your face, to gaze on your beauty, to know you. Open your lives to me and allow me to touch your heart. Open your ears to hear my voice to speak into your lives and follow me. Amen.